welcome to the to the Godort juried panel presentation, COVID's Uneven Impact. My name is Liza Weisbrod, and I will be moderating our panel today. We have three speakers who will examine how COVID has affected different communities. First, Dr. Cassandra Logan from the U.S. Census Bureau will discuss the Household Pulse Survey, a survey designed to collect data on the way in which people's lives have been affected by the pandemic. Next, Dr. John Kruger, the Undersecretary of Medical Staff and Quality of the Chickasaw Nation Department of Health, will talk about how the pandemic has affected the Chickasaw Nation and the tribal response to COVID. Finally, Dr. Preetha Iyengar, the Chief of the Outbreak Investigation Unit for the COVID-19 Response at the District of Columbia Department of Health, We'll discuss how the pandemic has impacted the District of Columbia and how the disease has been managed over the last year. After our speaker's presentation, we will have time for questions, so please go ahead and put your questions in chat. We'll start with Dr. Logan from the Census Bureau. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Cassandra Logan. I'm the survey director for the Household Pulse Survey, um, a survey run by the U.S. Census Bureau. So the, due to the coronavirus pandemic, there was a need for real-time data on social and economic, on the social and economic impacts of the pandemic. So the Census Bureau sought out to meet that need by quickly and efficiently in the government quickly and efficiently <laughs> deploying the household pulse survey. So it's an experimental survey um, and all the results are disseminated as part of the Census Bureau's experimental data product series. And as far as timeline is concerned, um, the household pulse went from idea to fruition within a month. So development of the survey began in March 23rd of 2020 and we began um, collecting data on April 23rd. And so we've had multiple phases of the survey so far, with the first phase running from April 23rd to July 21st, 2020. Um, and we worked with a number of federal partner agencies um, on the survey. Um, and we, as you can see on the slide, phase one were our initial partners of um, labor statistics, health statistics, HUD, the National Center for Education Statistics, USDA, and the Office of, Office of Management and, and Budget. Um, and then as we added on um, additional content coming from other agencies um, when we started different phases of the survey. So um, the content from um, phase two and phase three um, pretty much had the same content in agencies. But in October um, of 2020, we were under an emergency clearance. That's one of the reasons we were able to do it so quickly. But in October of 2020, we shifted from emergency clearance to a normal um, clearance from the Office of Management and, and Budget. So we were initially going to end um, phase, our initial phase three um, in December of 2020, but um, because the pandemic was still going on and there was still a lot of good information to, that we needed to collect, um, we continued phase three um, in January of, of 2020. And in, in, during that time, we added vaccination questions from the center, Centers for Disease Control. And then we also revised the questionnaire, dropped some questions and added some additional questions. So we're currently in phase 3.1, um, which began in April and it'll run through early July. So we, um, in this phase, we included additional content from the National Institute on Occupational Safety and Health, as well as the Maternal Child Health Bureau and Department of Defense. And so I'll cover the content in an upcoming slide. So we use the Qualtrics platform um, for the survey, which is a web-based survey instrument. You may have received other surveys using the Qualtrics platform. Um, we were able, one of the reasons we were able to, to do, to start the survey so quickly is because we already were, we were already able to use the, the platform. So we didn't have to worry about getting an authority to operate. We, we, it was already um, an instrument being used um, at the Census Bureau. So, you know, that was one of the benefits of being able to leverage existing infrastructure and data sources, and it got us out into the field pretty quickly. And also, because our national, due to the pandemic, our national processing center was closed, and that's usually where we send mail-out invitations for surveys 
um, as well as our telephone centers were closed. And of course, we couldn't send out um, our field representatives to do in-person interviewing. This survey, we use email and text to send out invitations to households. So that, um, a lot, you know, that's one of the reasons um, it's still experimental because, you know, um, when you when you send out email, text and invitations, you don't really get that much of that much of a response back. Face to face phone calls are always still the best ways to collect data. And one thing we were able to do, we were able to use our master address file and link it to other files we had um, that had phone numbers and emails. And so we were able to match the, the master address file to these other files to come up with, um, that helped us to send out these invitations. Okay, so this is a rundown of um, the various content so initially, um, we did basic, you know, this is all the categories of the content. And so the black text are the ones that began in um, phase one. And then phase two and three, we added the content um, that's in red. And then in phase 3.1, we added the content in green. So we're preparing to um, preparing content for phase 3.2, which is set to begin um, in July. So throughout the throughout the survey, we dropped content, we've added content, depending on what was actually going on, going on in the world. So of course, um, a lot of people are interested in our um, vaccine content, vaccination, con intent to, to receive the COVID-19 vaccine questions. Also, a lot of the renter in um, and mortgage payment questions, like who's behind on paying a rent um, and mortgage, which is going to become even more important as the moratoria for um, rental relief and mortgage relief end, has ended. Um, so we'll have some ad additional content on that um, upcoming. Okay, so just um, discussing some of the findings from the survey. Um, so this shows, so this is through the end of phase three. Once phase 3.1 is complete, then we'll um, update these charts. But through looking at from the beginning through the end of phase three at the end of March, it's the this shows the percent of men and women not working because of children's arrangements. And so as it shows a higher proportion of women were not working due to children's arrangements, arrangements than men throughout the survey. And that just means like when children's um, childcare is closed or schools are closed, um, more women, um, more women's work is affected than, than men. Okay, this just shows, a, not just, this shows a percentage of adults in households where someone lost employment income um, since March 13, 2020. And this is just broken down by metro areas. So we collect the data, we have national level data, state level data, and then data for the 15 largest metropolitan statistical areas, or just metropolitan areas um, across the country. And so um, I just have to point out, um, or our mathematical statisticians will come after me, that <laughs> these are just point est estimates. This does not imply any significant difference between um, these metropolitan areas. Okay, next we have, um, this slide shows that the higher proportions of households with children report low or no, higher proportions of households with children report low or no confidence in, for, in affording food than households without children. So um, this just shows the difference, it's darker blue line are households that have children, the lighter blue line is households without children and um, their perception of their food security. Okay. And so as for confidence in paying rent or mortgage, we see that lower confidence in paying rent or mortgage among those who are aged 25 to 20, 20 I'm sorry, 25 to 44 with children than their age counterparts without children and even older adults um, with or without children. So young families, households with children have lower confidence or no confidence in paying their rent or mortgage um, on time than those households without children or older households. So shifting now to mental health, we have the proportion of adults feeling anxious, feeling worry, feeling a loss of interest, and feeling down in all households. And by comparison, we see the percentage of adults feeling symptoms of anxiety and depression in the National Health Interview Survey between January to June of 2019. So this looks at um, the percentage of um, 
of adults who have reported feeling these different measures of um, um, mental health versus what those per percentages were in um, 2019. Now, these are two totally different surveys, two totally different populations, but <clears throat> there does seem to be a marked difference in um, the reporting of um, anxiety and depressive symptoms um, due to the pandemic. But again, there's no, no statistical test for that comparison. So we can just make assumptions at this point. So if you're in, I just kind of give, give a brief snapshot of the survey of the data. Um, all of this is public accessible data. Um, so you can go to our website, census.gov slash household pulse data, and it'll give you access to, we have, we have um, every data collection period, which lasts about 13 days. We call them weeks, even though it's more than a week. We have data, we have detailed data tables. We have public use data files that you can, you know, do your own analysis with. Um, we also have an interactive data tool. And we um, are one of our new data products is a COVID-19 vaccination tracker. So all of that is on, um, you can access that through the website. And we also have a number of America's counts, America count stories or stories behind the numbers um, using utilizing the data from the household pulse survey. So these are just a few of the stories. We have um, the risks of children. We have how are Americans using our stimulus payments, um, how self-employed adults are affected and um, how households with children <laughs> are more likely to report um, loss in um, employment during the pandemic. And then here's just a few more um, that hit on vaccinations, homeschooling, which is, you know, has been the thing over this past year, um, unemployment insurance and working from home. So many more of those you can find on the census website, census.gov slash library slash stories dot all, or just go to the census bureau website and you will find these America count stories. And these are just um, a number of websites that link to the different um, sources of data for the household pulse survey. But all of that, each of these sites you can you can get to just going to this main site of um, the census.gov slash household pulse survey. And that's all. If you have any questions, you can email us at addp.household.pulse.survey at census.gov. And a team member will respond to your inquiry. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Logan. I, I want to mention that Dr. Logan's slides are attached on the conference website if you'd like to spend some more time looking at those. Yeah, I've updated them, but I just took stuff out. I didn't add anything, so. <laughs> Thanks. Next speaker will be Dr. John Kruger, who is the Undersecretary of Medical Staff and Quality of the Chickasaw Nation Department of Health. Good afternoon. It's uh, my honor and privilege to represent the Chickasaw Nation today and to speak with you and try to convey a little bit about what we did for our coronavirus response uh, within the Chickasaw Nation. Uh, I am the Undersecretary of Medical Staff and Quality, so I serve within the Chickasaw government under our Secretary of Health. And I'm also the Chief Medical Officer and Chief Quality Officer for the Chickasaw Nation Department of Health. A little bit about the Chickasaw Nation. So there are roughly 70,000 Chickasaws um, uh, and about half of them live within our territorial boundaries. Uh, we cover a roughly 13 county area in South Central Oklahoma. Uh, the capital of the Chickasaw Nation was originally Tishmingo, uh, which is down to our south. Uh, but right now uh, we are located in Ada, Oklahoma, where our capital is. Uh, we have four health campuses within the Department of Health where we deliver most of our services. The Chickasaw Nation um, uh, migrated to this area during uh, the forced removal of the Trail of Tears in the 1800s, uh, and then uh, was able to purchase uh, this uh, most of this land that you see here. Uh, and this is our territorial boundaries. We are technically a reservation. However, we're an integrated population within this reservation, meaning that the bulk of the citizens living within these territorial boundaries are not Chickasaws. Uh, there are people uh, that, that are not, uh, so we're not a reservation as most people would perhaps envision a reservation, even though um, uh, due to a recent Supreme Court decision, uh, we are considered a reservation still. Um, so um, 
this integrated population, we live and work with our neighbors. And so, uh, but our health service uh, in general, uh, during uh, times when there's not a pandemic going on, would only treat um, CDIB card holders. Those are feder uh, members of federally recognized American Indian or Alaska Native tribes that were eligible for a uh, tribal health benefit. So we serve a number of tribes. There's over uh, 70 different tribes or 35 different tribes within the state of Oklahoma, but we serve over 70 different uh, tribes within our departments of health. However, during the pandemic, um, we needed to do things differently. And so as in March, as the pandemic broke, we stood up our incident command team uh, and started to really work on a plan uh, for how we were gonna address the pandemic. Again, if our neighbors become sick, they infect us. And so we had a really challenge. We're not isolated where we can shut off our borders or do things like that. On top of that, that's never been the Chickasaw philosophy. Our governor, who you'll see on the next slide, has served nine consecutive terms as our governor of the Chickasaw Nation. And we've enjoyed a great prosperity during uh, his tenure. And uh, our, the mission of the, uh, the Chickasaw Nation is to enhance the overall quality of life of the Chickasaw people. I will tell you that what he tells us all the tide, time is a rising tide lifts all ships. And so we really believe that if we do well for the Chickasaw people, that we'll do well for the rest of the citizens that are living in our area. And so we've tried to do that. We have a vibrant workforce of almost 16,000 people and have almost 200 businesses that we're responsible for. Uh, we provide a lot of services uh, in our in our 13 county area, but also to the rest um, of many of Oklahoma, many Oklahomans, and also Texans. Uh, our vision is to be a nation of successful and united people with a strong cultural identity. And this year, our, our mission became to be one Chickasaw nation. So we really all work together across all of our governmental divisions, across all of our enterprises, to come together to try to address this pandemic head on. And I think that was really the success. This is a picture of our governor, Bill Anatubby, uh, and Lieutenant Governor uh, Chris Anatubby, and they have served uh, with great leadership during this period of time and provided us with a mandate to protect and preserve life. Uh, that was really our leading mandate during the entire pandemic, and it gave us great clarity in what we did uh, during this time. As you know, American Indians and Alaska Natives according to many reports, are at least 1.8 times greater to die uh, from coronavirus. Uh, and what we saw in our health system, uh, and that is, that is uh, as compared to non-Hispanic whites. Um, so we were one of the, uh, some additional data came out from the Color of Coronavirus Project that showed uh, that we were experiencing, uh, in general across the nation, American Indians and Alaska Natives were uh, experiencing rates of death that were significantly higher, as much as 64 to 70 percent higher than non-Hispanic whites. What was also interesting about that and something we experienced in our health system was that the deaths uh, proportionally were higher in people who were younger. So between the ages typically of uh, 40 and 55 uh, or 40 and 60. And I think the reason that we saw that here, although it's difficult to parse through the data, is that our elder patients stayed home. They truly remain locked in their homes uh, for the last 15 months. And some are even really uh, leery about coming out even when they're fully vaccinated. So they listened, they listened and stayed home. Uh, some of our other folks uh, either had to go to work, uh, but working with the Chickasaw Nation, we did a lot of accommodations of our workplace. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward. One of, our, one of our big uh, success stories this year uh, is uh, we took our vaccine and our testing allocations, materials, and supplies from the Indian Health Service. Uh, with that, we were able uh, to convert a lot of our health campuses and workforces, and we brought in and using lean and Toyota production system technology, we developed mass testing and mass vaccination uh, capabilities, and we provided the bulk of the testing uh, in our 13 county areas. Uh, and we provided a significant amount of the tests that were run in the state of Oklahoma, um, as well as a significant amount of the vaccines. So we had very robust capabilities with these sites, even though we never um, had to utilize it at full bore. Uh, we had the capability to do 6,500 vaccines per day uh, in these mass vacs, which are seen here in this picture is our state-of-the-art uh, 16 lane mass vaccination site located in Ada. Uh, so this uh, site will take a car 
uh, the drive in to drive out time, including your 15 minute wait, it was averaging around 18 minutes. So we can take a very high volume of cars uh, through this facility and, and, and work, work that every day. We also had similar testing uh, drive ups. Uh, we also did walk ins and those sort of things. And in, all, in total, we had more than 20 different sites operational uh, during the pandemic. Our response strategy really hinged on these areas. Again, we ran our, ICE, our incident command teams and used traditional incident command structures, but really was about governance. So, you know, what was what was our leadership doing? And again, our having strong leadership with a mandate to protect and preserve life, uh, really uh, as our guiding uh, light uh, was really important during this policy. So we had pol hundreds and hundreds of policies that we managed to pull together very rapidly and get incorporated and also standardized across all of our operations, whether it was a casino or whether it was a healthcare workplace. We made some nuanced changes to those, uh, to those areas, childcare, et cetera. We were able uh, to um, utilize some of the CDC guidance for sure and other, other expert guidance, but we really had to uh, determine how we were gonna keep our, our workplace safe and I'll show you some data on what we did to do that. Our planning, structure and operations. Again, there's a lot you can do with facilities to make them uh, safety proof. Um, and, uh, you know, things like air handling standards and those sort of things. I didn't think it was possible. I'm a public health guy by training. If you told me I had to keep a gaming industry uh, safe during this year, uh, I'd have kind of laughed, but it's actually very possible. And I'll show you how we knew that that was possible in a moment. Logistics, finance, and analytics. Our electronic strategy, uh, like uh, Cassandra, we use the Qualtrics app as well. We had to develop a lot of our own applications uh, on the fly when we started um, uh, mass testing. Uh, funny thing we were doing, we were actually taking a picture of it, casting it into a tent of the form where it would be printed off, matched with a bag. We had a whole process to that. So when Qualtrics came along, it operationalized all of that for us, uh, which was a very happy day. We were a little skeptical at first and that it would work, but it, it worked actually really great. So uh, really this is uh, the big part of our electronic strategy was COVID testing, contact tracing. We had our own 24 contact uh, tracers and case investigators, which was a very important part. We had, an off we had a defensive strategy for most of the pandemic. Uh, we used testing defensively to keep our workplace and all of our patients. Uh, we, we serve over 100,000 patients here at Chickasaw Nation um, and our, in our workforce, like I said, and their families and the community uh, was really what we were trying to keep safe. Daily screening, everybody logged in every day with the app, so this was all integrated. Uh, we had employee clearance. Uh, this involved not only the app for clearing at your supervisor level uh, or central command level, but then we also had COVID clinic where you could go and get a workup either virtually or in person. Uh, we had various COVID clinics spread around our system. Random sampling. This was really something that was unique to, I think, to our pandemic effort. We randomly sampled our workplace. So if you got through all of our safeguards, what we wanted to know was how good was everything working? So the masking, social distancing, air handling, barriers, work from home, you know, quotas on how many people could be, the, the percent of the workplace that could be open, thus so on and so forth. Um, we wanted to know, okay, if we got through all that, uh, how good were we doing? And so you would get randomly, we had a statistically significant sampling of our workforce that we did um, every day. Um, and uh, it had 95% confidence with a 95% confidence interval is what we were leaning toward. Uh, and uh, so we could tell if there were people that were positive in our workplace. And so we found them, uh, that would let us know. And then we used that data that we got back from that random sampling to readjust uh, some of our mitigation uh, efforts there. Um, we would also do occasionally, in, a, in addition to surveillance testing, we would do what's called suppression testing. So let's say we had an outbreak in an area uh, at work, and our, I will say our workplace outbreaks were very, very few, but we did have a few, usually for breaches in protocol uh, was, a, was a key reason. Uh, and when we did, we would do suppression testing. That meant everybody got tested in that department, as well as their contacts, the contract tracers found for a period of time until we saw no more coronavirus. So pretty, I'm not sure we did it right, but it was, as we like to say, uh, I'm not sure it was the right way, but it was a way. Um, antibody testing, we did use some antibody testing along the year, 
And what we saw was overall uh, in the community, we saw about a 15.6% native infection rate within the community uh, across the entire community over time. Our analytics, uh, we had very robust analytics over the year that we could use to make, and I'll share some of that with you in a minute. Then obviously we had a vaccine solution. So both testing and vaccination, there was a QR code you clicked on. It was publicly put out to the public. It was broadly shared on media uh, and you just clicked on that code and then you could sign up in the app. And then if you couldn't sign up, we had a call center. Uh, we had people on site that you could just come on site and sign up. And we found that to be, remove a lot of barriers uh, with this program. On the left, you will see uh, some of how we were looking at data there. This is uh, looking at uh, looking at our Toyota production system data. So we used a lot of visible data with our teams during the day. So some of it, not everything we did in Qualtrics. Sometimes we would do time studies because we wanted to make sure we had an efficient uh, process. Uh, what people, what we discovered is people don't like to wait, uh, even though they may be getting a free service. Uh, a lot of there's a lot of anxiety going on and. So if you can uh, reassure them, keep them busy, keep them engaged during this process and get them through the process as smoothly as possible, as professionally as possible, uh, that really works. So we called ourselves, uh, not, to, not to use a commercial source, but we called ourselves a Chick-fil-A of uh, vaccine and testing. So that, that, that we became quite proud of that over the year and my, our teams uh, really took that as a badge of honor uh, at keeping our, our cycle times low. This is just an example of some of the places. This was using a large ballroom in a gaming institution uh, as a source for, for vaccines. We also had an outdoor clinic that I can't show here. Uh, and again, the um, you would get a QR code, you would scan that. It had all the it had all the screening and things in that in that app. Uh, and we developed all that with Qualtrics this last year. So this is our data and our testing over time. So to, to date, we've performed 120, almost 124,000 as of today, uh, COVID-19 test. Um, we've delivered 61,761 COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, that's 85% of our elder cohort uh, has been fully vaccinated at this time. Um, and 85% of our health uh, staff here in the Department of Health and has received one dose and 83% are fully vaccinated here. Uh, within our employee base, we're up to 73% uh, percent with one dose and a little over 70%, almost 71% fully vaccinated. By way of comparison, Oklahoma is sitting at 35% fully vaccinated and 41.7, 35% uh, fully vaccinated. The U.S. is somewhere between 40 and 50% vaccinated, depending on which source you pull it from. So you can see this big, uh, I want to point out one spike on this data. So you see that big 8421 spike. Uh, and what that was, uh, we actually retested all of our employees that were going to be coming, returning to work across all of our enterprises within Chickasaw Nation. So we had a mass testing event over one week before we brought everybody back from the, uh, when everybody had gone home, uh, we brought everybody back and tested them. Uh, and so that's why you see that data. Again, not sure it was the right way, but it was a way. This is a slide that really tells a story and so um, since we've started vaccinating since December 14th, 96.3% of all of our infections, we've, we've detected 1,863 employee positives since that time, but 96.3% uh, have been in non-vaccinated personnel. So uh, we, we felt like that was important uh, to share with people because, uh, as you know, we've dealt with a lot of vaccine hesitation, and I'll show you in a minute how we've been dealing with that here. Um, but uh, the thing we're most proud about, if you look at the graph below, this is a seven-day rolling average. The top line is the community members. Uh, the bottom line are our employees. Um, and what we could show at all times is that we kept our workforce at least 50% less infected at all time than the community, which is really hard to do because when people go home, they like to do the same things as their neighbors. A lot of, a lot of our employees are non-Native uh, American, uh, non-American Indian. Uh, and so uh, that you, a lot of our, um, our, our American Indian, Alaska Native patients and employees are married non-natives and have um, and so there's a mixing of traditions and cultures here uh, that's really robust and um, so a lot of times our data would look exactly like the community if we didn't do anything differently and so we were we really focused on this over the year uh, and tried to keep that those rates low because we knew from our hospital 
uh, that was providing a lot of services to both American Indian beneficiaries and Alaska Native beneficiaries, but also during surge times to the community um, that uh, if you had infections, uh, it eventually would equal deaths. You see here a lot of our drive-through lanes and some of our indoor events and things like that. We provided vaccines in the end to over 38 different states. Uh, what we discovered is some states had different rules around who they were vaccinating and be very rigid about their rules. And so um, and we understood the rationale for that, but we were moving so fast through our priority populations. Our strategy was once we started to see slowing in a priority population, as long as we could guarantee we had a second dose for those folks that, was, that we were sure was gonna come in on procurement, that we would go ahead and open up the next category. We kept the categories moving. As long as we were sure we had the capacity to va continue vaccinating everybody in that category, we would keep moving. So we did not hold back on vaccines, but we also never ran out. And that was really important. Some groups used, uh, really went with maximizing their first dose response. And what happened is we started to get a lot of people coming to us asking for their second dose. The second dose wasn't there. And we saw a lot of hesitancy and that, that was a big dissatisfier we saw with patients about that. So um, we achieved 80% uh, within the Department of Health, 80% first dose and 64.76% fully vaccinated dose of our employees up by 422, which was really uh, blazing along there. Next slide. So I wanted to show this slide because this is really our, our employee strategy. And I know I'm talking a lot about our employees, mainly because we have great data on our employees. It's a little more difficult to get data from the community. Uh, the state of Oklahoma was also vaccinating. There were some private enterprises that were also vaccinating. So we're in the process of collecting that and updating that. It's just not quite ready for prime time. So we know our patient population is much more vaccinated than our current data shows. Uh, we just can't collect all the data sources together. But you see over time, uh, we went through our priority work, our priority workforces and also our patient population priority uh, groups. But this is just showing the employee data. We did some special events. So again, special events, bringing the data, bringing the vaccine to the source of the people, you're much more likely to get participation. It's kind of a no brainer, but it, uh, but it makes sense. Um, and then we had extensive messaging during this, this next phase. And then we had something, um, uh, I know a lot of states have used bonuses. So we did have uh, our governor uh, allowed everybody that was fully vaccinated by a certain date and allowed enough time and we were sure we had enough vaccine to give to everybody that really wanted one uh, by that time, obviously, but um, we got an extra bonus. So there was a, there was a bonus added on uh, to employees that, that did get that. Uh, and again, we all get a, we all get a annual bonus. If we meet our goals and things like that. So we got an extra 10% bonus added to that bonus if, if that happened. So um, that was that resulted in a pretty big surge. It's now starting to tail off. I have some data past this. So you will get, again, all these things work, uh, but it might give people some ideas. So I guess in closing, uh, the lessons we learned were you have to commit to a mission. Um, you need to organize around solidarity and unity and purpose. So uh, try to get try to get the, the, the willing uh, to come together um, and everybody be on the same page about what it is you're trying to do. Uh, be open to new ideas and ways of doing things. Uh, like every day, our, our, our saying was, we have a thousand problems to solve, and I just got a thousand and one. So it was always a new problem to solve every day. We just, we just started and worked through them. You have to know your populations and understand the needs of your vulnerable populations. We learned a lot about this. Uh, populations don't fall into distinct categories like um, priority populations for vaccines. So we saw a lot of our elders not wanting to get the vaccine because their spouse wasn't eligible according to our priority population. So we had to make some modifications of that on, on the fly as we went along. Our vaccination efforts mirrored exactly Roger's diffusion of innovation curve. So you have the uh, innovators, the early adopters, <laughs> the late adopters, and then you got the laggards. So, and it will exactly mirror that. And there's different strategies for each one of those populations. Like I said, populations are rarely hom fully homogenous. Uh, they're complicated. There's complicated relationships and reasons. So uh, you have to you have to try to listen and understand that with each one of of, of your populations. Um, technology is a solution, but it can also be a barrier to some people. And what I mean by that is not all people know how to operate an app or a cell phone. So you have to have multimodal 
uh, communication, multimodal um, uh, ways of delivering that service. Uh, and telling stories through data is very powerful. Uh, when you want to get people convinced, you have to tell a personal story about you or about why, you know, about another person and why it matters, but also tie that into data and slowly but surely people start to come around because, uh, you know, as Dr. Deming said, in God we trust, all others must bring data. So uh, defensive and offensive strategies. So as you heard, we didn't have the vaccine. We didn't have therapeutics like vamilinivimab and other injectables early on in the, in, the, in the vaccine. So we had to use a purely defensive strategy. And I think that was really where we figured out that you can keep a workforce, it's a lot of work, but you can keep a workforce, a population, people safe if you use all of those different layers. Uh, later on, once we have an offensive strategy using vaccine, using therapeutics, uh, your strategy shifts somewhat uh, but you got to still keep up that defensive strategy a little bit. And that's all I have today. It's really my pleasure to speak to you and uh, Chokma. Thank you, Dr. Kruger. Our final speaker today will be Dr. Preetha Iyengar, who is the Chief of the Outbreak Investigation Unit for the COVID-19 response at the District of Columbia Department of Health. Dr. Iyengar. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, all right, so uh, thanks everyone uh, for having us join you. Um, so uh, I, um, as, as mentioned, I'm uh, Preetha Iyengar. I uh, led the outbreak unit for the uh, COVID-19 response. And um, typically I'm a medical officer at the Department of Health leading the infectious disease surveillance programs there. Oops. Yeah. Um, so uh, just starting off with uh, kind of how the pandemic looked in DC. So um, our first case was announced on March 7th, um, but um, as I'll show you in a few minutes, our, our preparation began a little bit before then, um, but I think uh, de definitely was different than any of us imagined. Um, really the outbreak was characterized by two major peaks in, um, in DC and, um, you know, uh, and I can just, and I will describe, um, you know, how our response varied through, throughout this, uh, throughout this time period. Um, so for us, our preparation probably began, it says February here, but even as early as uh, January, when we activated our incident management team to start prepping for the public health emergency um, that was kind of anticipated. Um, we initially um, were, you know, it, our approach from the beginning has always been data driven. Um, and the, the epidemiology team was at the, the forefront of um, the, the incident man management team and worked closely um, with the DC government and the mayor's office. Um, so initially uh, we were um, just monitoring our data and then as things picked up, um, had to in, in March is when our, um, in mid-March is when the, the city shut down. Um, and very quickly, uh, health departments across the country, including uh, DC, just had to scale up in a number of ways. Um, we were producing guide, guidance for the public. We were establishing test sites. Um, we had to establish a contact trace force. So, um, you know, part of the job of an epidemiologist standard is case investigation and contact tracing. We really had to scale those things up, right, to a um, kind of unimagined level um, and the technology that supports that. And I, I hear that echoed in, in the other presenters as well. Um, we established an alternate care site for hospital bed surge. Um, the public health emer emergency was declared, like I said, in early March. Um, and then we had to make sure that there were um, free COVID-19 testing sites um, available um, throughout the city. Um, and also uh, monitor our data to make sure that they were being utilized um, and that everybody had the access that they needed. Um, from May to November 2020, um, we stood up our, our call center. Um, I think it might have actually been a little bit before May, so that essentially um, any, any resident would be able to um, get access to testing, um, questions, guidance um, 24 hours a day. Um, we expanded our hours and locations of public testing. Um, we also uh, performed uh, a serology uh, study at that time. Um, and we uh, it was then that we were also planning for distribution of the vaccine that everyone um, knew, knew and hoped it would come um, and very happily came quickly and was extremely effective. 
um, we launched our DC um, COVID alert notice, DC CAN, which was our exposure notification um, system. Um, this, we thought this was particularly important in DC. Um, we have a lot of travelers, international, domestic. Um, I'm sure as you all remember, there were many First Amendment events. Um, so those um, happen out, outside of the, the jurisdiction of our, of our uh, mayor's orders. Um, so we just wanted a way that if people could opt in to know if, to, to, to have some ability to prevent outbreaks um, as there was a group of states where uh, that had shared information. Um, we also began to organize the DC Health Scientific Advisory Committee um, around that time and that um, advised us on um, development and implementation of safe, effective and equitable COVID-19 vaccine distribution. It was made of a panel of um, local experts and scientists. Um, from December 2020 um, to May, um, that is when we began our, um, to May 2021, began our vaccine distribution. Um, we launched our vaccine registration system um, and actually launched and sunsetted actually um, as things went into uh, to our normal channels. Um, we also launched self-testing kits. So kind of changing from a posture of having open testing sites everywhere to make sure that people have access in that way. Um, and then also launched my IR, which is a way that people can log in and see their vaccination history. Um, so this kind of shows the public health rules during the COVID-19 response. Um, so there's a, kind of the pieces of the puzzle that put together a successful response in DC. Um, so I'll talk through through each of these, I'll kind of highlight each of these things and give you some examples of the data behind them. Um, so surveillance. So um, this is extremely, uh, extremely important <laughs> basis of what all of us are kind of um, working on as we were building our responses, right, to COVID-19. Um, so really critical and um, a massive undertaking that that um, local health departments scaled up very impressively fast. Um, uh, there was a ton of data, like the number of lab laboratories opening up and the data that needed to come in and building the system that were able to handle that clean that and interpret it for daily reporting so that people, so that our leadership and both the public could know what's happening, um, right, in our city, um, and then being able to communicate that nationally. So that was really critical. Um, it also led in DC to us developing our reopening metrics, which was another method of communication for us to the public, like, hey, this is how we're doing in DC. Um, so we looked at four different values. There's a level of community spread, um, the health system capacity, the public health system capacity, and community engagement. So I think in the beginning, when things were locked down, it was definitely very much like, okay, health systems and public health systems prepare. And then we also, but we also needed the community to engage. Like if the community didn't pick up when the contact trace force calls, it wouldn't be successful. Um, so just an example, this is data that is available on our website. Um, you can see again how this was characterized by two curves. Um, we uh, kind of labeled what we, um, you know, how to interpret it. Um, and then, but you can see here, um, you know, our initial curve last April, our second curve this December, January, and, and coming down really, really nicely now, which we're seeing across the nation, which is great. Um, looking at health system, example of health system capacity, um, this is the percent of uh, COVID cases that were hospitalized. Um, so we monitored this again very closely to make sure that our health system was not going to be um, overburdened along, along with a number of other things. Uh, it's just one of the examples and the publicly available one. Um, we also looked at our data um, broken down in different ways so that we could see who in our population uh, were being affected. Um, so this is looking at the cases by age um, and race and ethnicity. Um, and so kind of this clearly uh, demonstrates here the disproportionate um, burden on the Black, not Hispanic uh, population um, across all age groups. Um, in DC, we also looked at outcomes by ward. Um, this is the cumulative incidence, meaning like the total number of cases over time throughout the pandemic. Um, so you can see here, again, the, the burden is in wards four, five, seven, and eight, which is where our um, Hispanic and um, Black or African uh, population are um, in majority. Um, looking at hospitalization data again, I mean, we'll see the similar themes. Um, so we look at, at it again over time, but also by gender, by age, by race, and it helps us understand, you know, the epidemiologic burden in the population. Um, so by age, not surprisingly, it increases the risk, the, the burden of hospitalization increased with age. Um, but again, the disproportionate burden on the Black and not Hispanic population. And that same um, was echoed um, when we looked at our, at our death data. 
Um, so now just briefly talking about COVID-19 testing. Um, so again, it was very important for us that we were ensuring that there was equal access to testing. Um, and then also making sure that there was connections to care. So this is just an example of the testing by ward in the last week. Um, so you can see that the uptake in the wards at this point um, was, is, uh, is quite equal throughout. And we really um, strive for that in the beginning to make sure that everybody in every ward had the access that they needed. Uh, sorry, I saw that it's. I saw the time, so I'm I'm uh, going a little faster. Um, so there's also uh, so another huge component is the disease investigation and contact tracing, um, and the public health consultation and technical assistance. So um, the way we approached it is really um, looking at our data, looking at community settings, businesses, and then also healthcare facility settings. Um, that data is pretty complex. So I'm not going to get into into it really here. I'll focus on the community side. Um, but we have the contact trace force to contact individuals, um, to do case investigation and contact individuals to identify contacts. But we also had an epi team that was focused on outbreaks um, and a way for businesses to submit information if they had more than one case so that we could um, provide support to kind of contain the spread within their business. Um, so this is a summary of DC's outbreak data. Um, and you can, it kind of helped us assess, you know, like what, what are really, what are our places of risk? Like what are places that need more support? Um, again, what's great for us now, um, we haven't actually had an outbreak since, um, an outbreak within the outbreak since May 21st. Um, but you can see it helps us assess, like we can see that they're in DC, um, what was really contributing were, um, you know, not surprisingly, childcare, um, office buildings, restaurant bars, school buildings and universities. Um, so kind of helped us when we were developing our guidance and how we were pulling that our, our, the mitigation measures. Um, so with health guidance and risk communication, again, um, very brief focus on this topic because it's a, a, a hugely important role. Um, you know, we found ourselves, uh, especially epidemiologists, we found ourselves, you know, from the being always in the background with our surveillance to suddenly having to explain uh, to news reporters what an epi curve was. Um, so really interesting shift in how people were um, uptaking the data and needing to understand, right? Because it really was, they could see the impact on their everyday lives. Um, so, you know, some of our communication, our website, coronavirus.dc.gov was a major source of communication. All of our guidance was up there. The mayor's orders were up there. Um, you know, we have a lot of information about vaccines in different forms, um, helping people to understand what they are. Um, the mayor and our director had um, weekly and twice weekly press conferences to interact with the public, interact with the, the press. Um, and then we also have very specific communication for healthcare providers through health notices, through the guidance documents and algorithms. Um, and then there's a whole separate, um, there's, a, there's an entire separate response for vaccination, um, which I can talk to you in a minute. And then the last part is uh is vaccination so um this is uh this kind of shows the vaccinations in dc over time um so really had we we've we've done um i think pretty well in dc which we're really excited about um we were able to achieve the goal um president biden's goal of 70 percent of the population over 18. so we're we're really excited about that we are looking at our data in different ways to, to target right hesitancy and our resources for where people, where their support is needed. Um, so this is looking at coverage levels. So the percentage of a certain population um, that have taken the vaccine. Um, so, and we've broken it down by race and age group as well. Um, so, uh, you know, you can see that there is, there's lower uptake in the black or African-American and, um, than less so in, than in the Asian or Pacific Islander population. But also you can really see these, the differences by age group. So in that 65 to 74 age group, like that age group took it, like I think we're more than 85% in that, in that age group. Um, but as you get, as you get uh, into the lower age groups, that's where you really see it drop off in the black African-American populations. And that's where um, we have a lot of efforts going on now, partnerships, community-based organization, um, a community service core that's going out into our ward seven and eight um, that are going literally door to door to kind of that, have that one-on-one -on -one, uh, interactions to uh, address hesitancy um, and also um, some incentives are, are, start, are coming out as well. Um, and yeah, sorry, just as kind of a, a last slide, like again, looking at that coverage by ward, which helps us um, 
direct resources and make sure that we're um, we're addressing hesitancy in the correct uh, populations and in the correct ways. Um, they've also been doing, you know, focus groups to get the appropriate themes and things like that so that we can really develop our messaging well. Um, so um, that's all I had for today. I'm happy to take any questions and uh, thank you all so much for, for having us here today. Thank you, Dr. Iyengar. We do have a few questions in, in the chat. Uh, we have one that is a comment and says it's not a, let's go here, not a question, but a shout out as someone who lived and worked in Ada for four years, I wanted to shout out the amazing impact of the Chickasaw Nation on Ada and East Central o Oklahoma community. I'm so glad someone from the nation is speaking today. We also had a question uh, for Dr. Kruger. Was there any vaccine hesitancy within the Chickasaw Nation? You're muted. Okay. We're not hearing you. While Dr. Kruger is getting a sound going, we've had uh, questions if if your slides will be available. So if you if that's possible, we could post them on the conference site. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Sorry, don't know what happened there, but I got an error message the mic went out. So. <laughs> uh, so. Yes, to the question of vaccine hesitancy, we have had uh, vaccine hesitancy. Um, uh, I would say, you know, our most of our population here um, kind of mirrors, you know, what um, you know, Oklahoma populations. Uh, there's been um, a lot of vaccine misinformation that we've seen. Uh, we've addressed that uh, point on. So we own our own media. Uh, outlets, you know, we own radio and, and um, our own Chickasaw TV. We have um, several different publications that are really beautiful that we get out. Um, and also, you know, through our workforce, through our clinics, through our patient populations, et cetera, we spend an, what seems like just um, an everyday battle. I get emails every day, you know, that, hey, I heard this or I heard that, and then you have to research it. Um, you know, I never thought my source was going to be, um, I forget one source that I got. I, I, I'd never heard of the, of the, of the rumor that had started. And so when I started looking at the source, I actually had to go into like uh, tabloids <laughs> to like figure out where this was coming from. And you, I actually quote it as a source because it is a source of sorts, but um, people get their news, I think very differently uh, in, in various parts of the country. I think a lot of it mirrors, um, some of the divisions we've seen across our country on, on other issues. Uh, and and there, there are obviously uh, agendas driving uh, some of these issues. Uh, and for whatever reason, people, uh, at times we've seen some, some groups really align with those. Those seem to be our most difficult people uh, to change their minds about the vaccine and try to uh, let them know that this is not a political, this is a public health measure. Uh, but this last year, as I'm sure it was, if you're all public health people, um, it, it was hard to practice public health for a while here in the United States. So uh, I think we have to be very clear about that, that, um, you know, public health tries to maintain that middle ground on this. But, um, you know, we had to we had to follow what we've been trained to do as public health people. That's what we that's all we were doing. But that was a threat to reopening an economy. And that became a big issue. Um, and so trying to understand that in the political context, I thought our, that's what I thought our leadership did really well. They threaded the needle and made it about protecting and preserving life. Uh, they made it, uh, they turned it into personal stories. They got the vaccine themselves and were very public about doing that. Um, they, um, when, it, when it came time to be tough at times um, and have those harder conversations with, with people that wanted to challenge the science or just ignore it and kind of, you know, have a um, kind of a strawman argument about things or 
you know, these kind of logical fallacies and arguments. We talked about that too. Nice way. We're nice people. <laughs> we're Midwestern, so we're nice. You know, I mean, that's how we are. It's our it's our culture here to be nice, but we're also um, pretty tough under the surface. Uh, we, there's a lot of resiliency, and we really built on that. Look, there are only 70,000 Chickasaws in the world. It's a big deal if we lose one, because that that's our that's our history moving on. You know, so every every life matters, but you know, because there's, because the Chickasaw Nation is so tied to um, uh, its history and its, and its heritage and, you know, where it came from and understanding where it's going. And th it's an oral tradition that's been passed down through generations. You, you don't know who that person is that has that piece of knowledge that you'll never get again. And so uh, you really, it really was our impetus this year. Uh, and we focused on that. Uh, and, and the thing I'm most proud about in the nation is that we work together across every department. I mean, when IT broke down, I had people, you know, from people that normally uh, worked in many of our other industries, they were out climbing up poles in our parking lots, to put in a mobile hotspot. I mean, it's just, it was amazing. We worked in tents, we got snowed on, rained on, tornadoed on, you name it, We it happened to us and we got through it all. And, and it's made us a lot stronger as a team. Um, across all of our group, but it, it brought a lot of people together. And uh, when times got tough, we leaned on each other. So yeah, there is vaccine hesitancy to this day. Um, we continue to, to just chip away at it. It's slower growing now. Once you get over the, in the 80s, <laughs> it's hard. I mean, I'm not sure we'll ever get to 100%, but we have had some departments within, um, some employee departments get to 100%. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate our speakers. They were great. Uh, we are out of time, but this uh, program has been recorded and it will be available on the conference site along with the slides. So thank you everyone for attending and thank you especially to our speakers.